I appreciate there's quite a specialist audience here and I also appreciate that the chairs are really, really comfy and um, it's kind of the middle of the afternoon. So everybody stand up. Go on, stand up. <laughs> there is a point. There is a point. Well, slightly a point. Okay. We're all amongst friends here. Um, now, a lot of you are probably responsible for writing container runtimes, and uh, in that case, you can stay standing up. But if you have any sort of shadow of a notion that you're not 100% sure what we mean by a container, sit down. If you're like, hmm, lightweight VM, what does that really mean? If you're kind of, hmm, uh, Isolated execution environment. Well, I understand the words, but I don't know what that means in practice. If any of that is ringing any bells, and bear in mind we are amongst friends, please just take a seat. Great. Okay. Um, if you don't program in Go, you're also allowed to sit down. Okay. Anybody who's still standing up, basically it's your fault if it goes wrong because you need to shout out if anything goes wrong. You are my peer reviewers. Okay. So... Um, I uh, am really massively plagiarising this talk from a talk that I saw by Julian Friedman. I don't think he's here today, um, but if he is, he, well, whether he's here or not, uh, massive credit to him for um, basically everything I'm about to show you. But when I saw this, I thought, oh my God, it all falls into place. And I felt the need to go home and run through the same code myself and put it all together and understand how containers work. And uh, I think Mark was talking about how containers um, sort of put together an illusion for uh, the code that's executing in them, that they're sort of operating in their own uh, environment. And what we're going to do this afternoon is sort of see how that illusion is, illusion is put together. OK, I don't know what all the other speakers were thinking of this morning, because I haven't seen a single one of those yet. And I thought it was the law that you had to have one of those pictures in every talk about containers. Uh, and uh, we are about to take one of those apart and see what it's really made of. OK, so <sighs> here's some code that I prepared earlier. There's not a lot to it at the moment. Um, I thought, given that we are a specialist audience, I don't really need to demonstrate this. But um, you all know that if you want to run uh, a command, you in Docker, you sort of type in docker run, the container name, and maybe there's a command and some arguments. And when I run my code, I'm going to do go run main.go. For those of you who aren't Go programmers, that basically says kind of compile and run my, my file here. So that's the equivalent of the Docker bit. Then we're going to have an argument that says run. And then we're going to have some commands and some arguments. So we want to be able to set up a, com a container. Our container is going to run whatever we specify in, those, in that command and the arguments. OK? So uh, we're going to look at the ooh, um, command line arguments that have been passed in. And first of all, we're going to look at the first one. And if it's run, hopefully the fact that not all of you are Go programmers won't you know, make this impenetrable. It's pretty straightforward. So if, it, if the first thing is run, great. And in any other case, we are going to fall in, oops, fall over in a big heap. OK, so great. What do we mean by run? Well, I'm a big believer in debugging. So let's uh, print out what we're trying to run. Ooh, uh, running. This is a bit awkward to type on this uh, thing here. Uh, so we're going to debug printing out everything from argument two and onwards. So that's our command and all the arguments. So that should tell us what we're trying to run. And uh, let's bring that up the screen a little bit more. We're going to set up. Uh, something that can actually run something. So the command we're going to run is specified by args2. That's the one that's called command. And optionally, oh, three and onwards. 
Right. This demo would again be very dull if I didn't uh, set up std in, std out, std er. I need to actually put an equal sign in there. Ooh. In. One more. Okay, and uh, I have this little utility function called must, which will just panic uh, if anything goes wrong. And we must run that command. So for the non-Go programmers, we're setting up this command, and then by calling run, we actually run it. Okay, uh, code reviewers, have I missed anything? Are we happy? Right, nobody's saying anything, so I think we're probably happy. Right. Um, right. This is uh, a Linux virtual machine running on my Mac. Um, it's got a shared directory so that I can uh, get at that main.go file I was just editing. Um, there are a few things running at the moment, not very much. Let's see what happens if we run my container. Let's go really wild and echo something. Okay. I think that, you know, that's a container, right? We've executed something. We said we wanted to echo container camp, and we have echo container camp. Must be a container. Right. Let's get really ambitious and see what happens if we run a shell. Well, it says it's running it. Can't really tell what's going on or if anything has happened. And uh, we can still see the same files. We can still see the same processes. And if I look at the host name, the host name is Liz Ubuntu. I could change that. Uh, OK. Um, we could tell from that process list that Go is running. So I must still be inside my container, because that's the, the executable I just ran. So if I quit out of this, I'm no longer in my container. But lo and behold, my container was able to write over the host name because there's no isolation at all at this point. That is not, Liz, a terribly secure container. Let's reset my oops, host name, otherwise things will get very confusing. Right, so that's just not good enough. We can't ship it yet. But fortunately, this is where we get into the exciting concept of namespaces. I'm going to need... Uh, sysproc attributes. Um, we need another library. Okay. Oops. Oops. I think this is like that. Sysproc attributes. And we're going to pass in some flags, or at least one flag. And this one is called clone new UTX for Unix time sharing system because we all know that Unix time sharing system means host name. OK, so I'm going to run this again. Can't really tell that I'm inside a container at the moment, but OK, host name is Liz Ubuntu, that's what we expected. Uh, let's call it uh, hostname ccamp. We're inside the container. It's, it is hostname ccamp. Let's exit the container. Well, hey, we have protected the hostname inside the container. So the running container can play with the hostname to its heart's content, and we haven't affected the host machine. OK, this is making progress. What about process IDs? We, we saw before that the process ID list was exactly the same as the host machine. And uh, fortunately, there's another one of these flags called clone new PID, new process ID. That sounds pretty promising, right? So uh, let's run that. We're inside the container. We run PS, and that doesn't look very different. OK, we're going to have to uh, debug this, I think. So 
it would be really nice if we could just come in here and uh, say we're running as process, um, get the process ID. Well, that's all well and good, except where I've got that debug line is before I've run the command. I haven't got my new uh, process ID. I haven't got my new uh, namespace yet for my process IDs. So we're going to do a little trick. We're going to have two copies. And the first copy is going to be run, and it's going to create our new namespaces. But it's not just going to run the command straight away. We've had a few people talking this morning and this afternoon about fork and exec. And running proc self exe is basically a fork exec. Uh, and now I have to invoke a bit of go sort of incantation so that I can pass in, instead of, you know how we passed in run as the first parameter before, uh, we're gonna pass in child when we fork an exec. No, that's not in the right place. It goes there. Okay. And this is going to be child. And we don't need to create new namespaces because we've done that already. So the first time when we come in here, we are, we call run. And we call run. And the second time, we come in, we call child. Yeah, so the, when we're in run, we're doing this fork and exec with the new namespace. I don't think I saved that. Okay. okay, right. We can see process ID of one. That sounds pretty promisingly as though we have created a process namespace. Hooray. But from inside our container, we still have the same list of processes. And they start with you know, 1,500 and what have you. So what's going on here? Well, as I'm sure lots of people here know, that PS doesn't look directly at the list of running processes. It looks in slash proc. And there's a whole load of processes that are running on my machine, and that's where PS gets its information from. So if we want PS to work correctly inside the container, out of there, we're going to have to uh, give it its own file system, give it its own slash proc at least. Um, and now, fortunately, I have, well, so in my home directory here, I've got uh, a host root file system, and I also happen to have with me, oh, be better if I spell it right, uh, I am a root file system. So this is a, a, a copy of, I think it was an Ubuntu uh, file system that I just happened to have conveniently lying around. So, inside our child process, we want to use that root file system. So, is it this way around? Is this cool? We're going to change the root to um, root fs. Oh, and we want to make sure that that works. And we also want to change directory to that uh, so that the root directory is home slash root fs. Okay. Let's try that again. Something has definitely changed here. And uh, the reason why it's changed is because I am a root file system. We have got that root file system looking like it is slash inside our container now. This is excellent. Uh, we can look at, uh, well, let's, let's look at uh, the process list. Ah, one last thing, slash proc is special. We have to mount it. Um, okay. This bit requires a lot of concentration because uh, it's critical that I get these parameters the right way round. There we go. One more. I got those the right way round. Are we happy with that? Good. Okay. Uh, quit out the container again. Run it again. 
And lo and behold, we have a process list just relating to this container. That's coming out of our own uh, slash prog inside the container. Just got those uh, small number of processes in there. We've built a container. We've got, thank you. That's what we need. So, I mean, you can, you can imagine that you can go further than, uh, you know, so for example, the user namespace, you, you might want to uh, isolate. But let's just sort of recap. That's what, 52, my code's huge, isn't that great? Um, 52 lines of code. Can somebody remind me what Docker's valuation is? I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I guess maybe that isn't quite ready to ship, not quite production quality. But I think it kind of gets across the, the idea of namespaces. So setting up inside your container what you can see. Um, so we covered the Unix time sharing system, which is host name. We covered process IDs. We looked at file system. You just have to do a similar sort of thing for users, inter-process communications and networking, and you're done. The other thing that people say, oh, when I first got involved with containers, people were always saying, oh, it's just namespaces and C groups. And everybody nods and kind of goes, oh, yeah, I understand what that is. OK. <laughs> right. This is namespaces. And C groups are control groups. And it's about limiting resources. And I think this doesn't really need um, to be demonstrated. You know, it's an easier concept. Um, you can say, well, I only want this container to have 10% of the CPU or a certain limitation on how much memory it can use. That's a pretty straightforward concept. But that's what people are talking about when they kind of go, oh, it's just namespaces and C groups. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on briefly is um, to sort of get towards why I'm wearing a badger on my shirt. Um, so images, container images. When we copied that file system over, if that had been done in a bunch of layers, that would basically be a container image. That's all we're doing with an image. We're creating the file system that the container sees. And we're also uh, throwing in maybe some configuration uh, commands, setting up things like environment variables. But that's all, all we're doing with a container image. And uh, the Badger comes in because a little project that uh, uh, I've been working on uh, called Micro Badger, which, which lets you look at those container images and inspect the different layers. So we saw some kind of diagrammatic uh, explanations of how layers are, are, are built up into an image in the previous talk. And you can use Micro Badger to sort of inspect exactly what's inside all the different layers in any public Docker host image. So I urge you to, uh, to check that out at your leisure. Um, Bit of further reading, uh, I kind of feel I really have to point you at Julian Friedman's uh, container gist. His is very slightly different from mine. Um, I also have one on my GitHub, which is slightly different from his. Um, and I would very much welcome any kind of comments and questions uh, and people using MicroBadger um, as our Twitter handle. Um, and that's pretty much the end of what I'm going to talk about. So, but I think I've got, uh, maybe I can take a question or two while I point at Gareth and Michael, and I hope they're paying attention because they need to come up because uh, we've got a little thing that we've been working on that we want to announce today. So, that's how you build a container. <laughs> that's how you build a container in 52 lines of code. Thank you very much. Thank you.